5005, which amends the 2022 biennium budget we adopted just five months ago. This has been a year of unprecedented unknowns as we respond to the steepest economic decline since the Great Depression and the greatest health crisis in 100 years. These forces necessitate budget reductions none of us want to make. However, as fiscal stewards of the Commonwealth, we are required to adopt a balanced budget. When the governor called us into special session almost two months ago, we knew we would face difficult choices in an attempt to close a revenue shortfall of $2.8 billion over the course of the biennium. That requires deferring many of the initiatives we proudly adopted in March. But let me say from the start, this is a special session and it is not our last opportunity. It is my hope that when we return in January, the economic environment will have stabilized and we can make further strides towards addressing our priorities. In spite of the current constraints, I am pleased to report that the committee package contains substantial funding to contend with many of the challenges COVID-19 has imposed. In particular, you will hear of record investments in broadband access as we help citizens work from home and students learn from home. This budget restores K-12 funding reduced as a result of the sales tax reforecast, directs federal CARES Act dollars to safe reopening and vital learning and provides flexibility to local school divisions as they respond to new ways of providing instructions. The Appropriations Committee Amendment Package also supports our institutions of high learning, of high learning education as they face historic revenue declines and increasing costs. Again, we have tried to provide them as much flexibility as possible because each has unique needs. In total, the package includes $80 million in sub supplemental general fund support to the institutions as well as a sub substantial investment of federal CRSs to help offset their cost. Unfortunately, the pandemic has hit, has hit our most vulnerable citizens the hardest, exacerbating the divide between the haves and the have-nots. It is our responsibility to help this population and through our budget amendments, we have focused our limited resources on stemming evictions and utility shutoffs by providing both funding and problematic, problematic support to pay down consumer utility bills and provide additional rent and mortgage assistance. In the same vein, our amendments provide funding to support additional unemployment benefits and prop up the unemployment trust fund. The amendments include funding for hazard duty pay supplements for the workers providing support for our vulnerable citizens on DD waivers and restore rate increases to support an adequate array of services provided who assist these individuals to reach their full potential. The amendments restore funding to alleviate census pressures on our state mental health facilities and provide some additional support for children's mental health services through the Virginia Mental Health Access Program. We will make these significant investments while sustaining physical responsibility. Recognizing the unique, the unique nature of the pandemic and the potential for further robust, the package directs an additional $150 million to the, flex, to the Flexible Revenue Reserve Fund. Unlike the rainy day fund, which is difficult to access, the secondary res reserve fund provides us the flexibility to remove the funding if needed to address a further forecast adjustment. And finally, I'd like to thank each and every one of the committee members for their work on preparing this package. Your input has been critical. While it has been a learning experience for us all, we have proven we have proven able to com 
complete our work in today's virtual environment. And so at this time, it is my great privilege to turn the rest of the budget presentation over to the committee. And uh, we certainly hope that you guys will be pleased with our presentation. And I turn it over to you. Mr. Chair, before we get started, would you like to take the attendance? Yes, please. Let's do that, Mr. Clerk. Delegate Sickles. You should see the roll come up. Un unmute Mark. Thank you. Yeah, I'm, I'm present. I guess. Delegate Sickles is present. Delegate Plum? Here. Delegate Plum is present. Delegate Jones? Delegate Ferris? Present. Delegate Ferris is present. Delegate Bloxham? Uh, I'm here. Delegate Bloxham is present. And Mr. Chair, we also received a message from Delegate Jones. He is present. Thank you, Mr. Clark. Is there a, is there a legal pad? Yes, of course. Okay. Thank you. Thank you all for your presence today. And uh, now we'll turn it over to Ann. Good morning, Mr. Chairman. Um, just to walk through a couple logistical items. First, each of you this morning should have received an email that contains um, a copy of this PowerPoint presentation, as well as a copy of the spreadsheet that you typically see at budget report out, list all the amendments, a package of the individual half sheets, and finally a copy of the new K-12 distribution sheets based on the changes contained in this package. Um, so those should all be available for you, and they are also on IHOD if that's an easier place for you to access them. Um, try to move as quickly as we can today because some of this will be information um, you have already heard, of course, as everyone's quite aware, we ended fiscal year 2020 with a shortfall of about $232 million um, as COVID impacted the Commonwealth's last quarter of revenues. Because we were 1% um, below the forecast, that under code mandated a reforecasting process that included the governor um, gathering together the Joint Advisory Board of Economists and then the Governor's Advisory Council on Revenue Estimates to review the forecast. Um, the governor decided to use the standard forecast for both years, although many members of both groups expressed some concern that revenues might come in a bit shorter. Uh, to hedge against concern that a lower forecast might be merited, the governor retained a very large cash balance um, in the budget he sent to you in House Bill 5005, um, hoping that deferred consideration of many issues um, could be handled at the regular 2021 session, which is coming all too quickly. Uh, they have already scheduled the components of the fall reforecasting process, so we will go through this again. JAVE is now scheduled to meet on November 4th. Gaker will meet on November 23rd, and then the governor will present another set of amendments to the budget on December 16th. The revenue reforecast that's embedded in House Bill 5005 um, pulls down FY21 revenues by about 5%. You go from an assumed positive 3% growth that was in Chapter 1289 to an assumed reduction of 2%. Currently, that brings revenues down about $1.4 billion in the current fiscal year. On uh, the second year of the biennium, the forecast actually on a growth rate basis is increased from 3.7 to 3.9, assuming that the economy will rebound and you'll especially see some more growth and withholding as unemployment rate drops. But because the base is so much lower, that results in an additional shortfall of 1.4 billion in the second year as well. So you came in facing a revenue shortfall of about $2.8 billion. Um, 
the slide, which we went over both at the beginning of session and we've talked about it in some detail in meetings through the course of it, simply shows um, the governor's actions in the introduced bill. Um, he found significant savings, the largest of which were about $2.1 billion almost from the conversion of what were on allotments in the veto session to reductions. Um, there were very few restorations. He also um, adjusted K-12 funding in both years of the biennium to reflect the reduced sales tax revenues embedded in the forecast um, and captured some savings from the continued enhanced federal match on um, Medicaid programs that is being offered under the CARES and broader pandemic legislation. Um, so in total, you'll see that you are left with an unappropriated balance of about 933 million the first year and 490 million the second year. In terms of the amendment package before you today, um, the chairman's general guidance to all the members and staff was to remember that this is a special session. It was established to address criminal justice and police reform impacts on our economy and government operations from COVID-19 and making those budgetary changes necessary resulting from the reductions um, related to COVID-19. So the amendment package before you um, is limited to amendments directly related to those topics, primarily in the area of K-12 and child care support, higher education, health care, including the mental health arena, um, as well as housing evictions, utility disconnections, and expanded broadband access and affordability. January will provide an opportunity to reassess the economic and revenue climate, and hopefully at that time, as the chairman has indicated, you'll be able to make some additional movement on your priorities. Um, staff was asked to identify savings and any revenue adjustments that could help restore some of the key actions that it appeared critical to implement at this time. Um, we've also included contingent appropriations to establish what the house's priorities are should the revenue picture remain on track and not face further declines. And finally, um, the members thought it was important to set out the expenditure of the coronavirus relief funds to maintain transparency um, and for the amounts not already allocated to direct those funds to house priorities um, since you are in the role of appropriators. The savings found are all highlighted on this slide 11. They total about $160.1 million. Um, staff will walk through most of these in the following tables. I'll just mention a couple items that aren't mentioned. Uh, the first thing, the largest item during the reconvened session, you provided $50 million to the governor of general funds. Um, to help with COVID-19 response. Three million of that is the only portion that's been spent at this time. So we would be sweeping the remainder back to the general fund, given the scope of the federal funds that are available for the same purposes. Um, in terms of revenue adjustments, ABC profits came in far higher than anticipated in fiscal year 20. We recognize both the 20 revenues that are is money in the bank, as well as updating the forecast to reflect the higher base. Um, most of the rest of these on the page are technical related to economic development projects that have, are either not occurring or being delayed because of COVID. Um, and a couple transfer items that you typically do, including from VASAP, a, an expiring commission and a freeze on career development program expenditures beyond those already in the program. There are a number of atypical funding items. The way this budget is um, set out, much of the action is back in central appropriation instead of in the specific secretarial areas. I just wanted to direct your attention to where the major funding items are. Item 479.10 includes all of the coronavirus relief funds. Um, the budget has two components of that. First, there's a table listing all of those amounts that the governor had already allocated prior to your return to special session. Um, this is the table that Secretary Lane showed you back in August. And then there are also tables appropriating the majority of the remaining CRF fund, and I'll go over those in a couple pages here. 
Um, item 479.20 relating to grain machines. You'll recall that during the reconvened session, the governor sent down amendments to the bill that um, banned the games of skill and instead put a one year extension on the moratorium. The revenues were to go into a COVID relief fund. Um, the language in the budget would redirect 95.2 million of those non-general funds in the first fiscal year to backfill the K-12 sales tax reduction. Um, Zach will talk about this further. We also have language requiring the governor to submit a plan for the use of any additional um, gray machine funding in the budget in September as well. December, I'm sorry. Um, item 479.30 sets out the contingent appropriations. Um, so I'm sure you'll recall in many times of economic uncertainty, there are items that you wish to fund, but what can we ensure that there is sufficient revenue available to do so? Um, you'll have two components here. First, any contingent appropriations for fiscal year 2021 um, would be dependent on the forecast that the governor will present in December, not being more than $100 million below the forecast contained in House Bill 5005. Um, and then appropriations for the second fiscal year will be contingent on the FY21 final forecast that is adopted by the 2021 General Assembly being met. The final item um, in central accounts that is atypical um, is 479.40, which contains all of the funding of the criminal justice reform bills. Uh, David will talk about this later, but there are about 10 that have gone through the House and are still at play, um, but understanding that they might be amended um, or all might not emerge. We put all of the funding together for those bills individually in central accounts, and they will be enrolled in appropriate items if they are enacted by both bodies of the General Assembly. In terms of the contingent appropriations, I, again, won't go through all of these because the respective staff will go over most of them individually, but they do total $207.4 million, the largest of which is a second year contingent bonus for both state and state supported local employees. Um, there's some funding for the school meals program, restoration of a number of Medicaid items. Um, also at the bottom of the page, you'll see we included a number of items that were in House Bill 5005 as introduced and made them contingent on the revenues as well, um, given that the, those priorities were no higher than priorities of House members and also these represented scalable items that could be funded at lower levels if revenues begin to decline any further. In terms of the coronavirus relief funds, as you'll recall, the Commonwealth received a total of 3.1 billion that can be utilized some of the outstanding funding issues. Um, these funds can only be used for items directly related for COVID-19 response. Some of the de delay in deploying this funding was um, in hopes that Congress would give some additional flexibility, but as you're aware, that has not occurred at this point. Um, so these revenues cannot be used to backfill revenue shortfalls, um, but have to be used for items directly related to COVID and must be spent by December 30th of this current year. Of the 1.3 billion that was still unallocated, the budget package before you appropriates the majority of the remainder. Uh, this first table simply outlines that which the governor had allocated prior to you all coming into session um, almost two months ago now. Um, these next pages outline the additional appropriations recommended in the amendment package. This list was de developed in concert with the governor's office to cover some of the priorities that they indicated they were looking to fund as well as addressing some additional issues that house members identified. Uh, the largest amount is the $210 million that would go to the DEC for expanded unemployment assistance or to shore up the um, unemployment trust fund. Uh, there's $200 million for the cost of reopening our K-12 um, schools. Last week, while presenting to the Senate Finance Committee, um, Secretary Lane indicated that they have received some new guidance from the U.S. Department of Treasury that does give flexibility to provide up to $500 per pupil um, 
of the CRF funds without having to go through a difficult audit trail and recounting of the expenditures. So the governor intended his um, announced his intent to put $200 million towards that purpose. Um, we are also proposing $120 million to establish a fund to offset consumer utility debt and pay down the bills of those in arrears because of COVID-19. Um, and I believe most of these other items will be discussed as we go through the individual areas. Um, this is all in dollar order, obviously. Uh, the only other item I'd mention on this page is there is a supplemental $10 million appropriation to um, Department of Elections to be distributed to the localities um, as flexible funding to address some of the atypical election year costs, whether it be funding the drop boxes, providing additional pay for election day workers as some localities have expressed interest in doing, as well as cleaning and personal protective equipment. This next page lists out the final items included in the House CRF package. Um, I'll just note a couple of them here that I don't believe are mentioned elsewhere. First, there's 7.7 .7 million for the Department of Corrections to help cover some of their um, medical observation unit cost and the substantial overtime costs they're facing during COVID as they can't move um, correctional officers to different facilities or out of um, different units for fear of spread. There's also an additional $7 million, $1 million per region for food bank funding um, and $3 million additional for emergency homeless housing. That would leave about $111 million unspent for the governor's discretionary usage. Um, we did also include a language amendment at your request to address um, the fact that the General Assembly believes they should be fully involved in the appropriation of these and any other federal funds that are made flexibly available to the Commonwealth. Um, there is hope that the Congress will pass additional relief for states, um, but even if there's not additional money at a minimum, there's hope that you could extend the deadline beyond December 30th to allow longer use of those funds or allow them to be used to backfill some revenue reductions. Uh, requires the governor to propose a plan for expenditure of any additional federal funds that are announced in his budget when it comes to you on December 16th and sets out dates for the quarterly reporting requirements to the money committees. Um, with that, I will turn it over to Kim to discuss the amendments in the area of commerce and general government. Thank you, Ann. Uh, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, our budget package, as Ann mentioned on previous slides, and captures savings and revenue adjustments. Um, and economic development, um, these equate to about $10.4 million. Um, the largest share of that is related to the recent announcement that Rolls-Royce will be closing its facility uh, on the Cross Point campus in Prince George County, Virginia. Uh, and that represents about $7.2 million worth of savings and revenue adjustments. Next slide. Um, our budget package includes $50 million from the general fund in FY21 to support the expansion of broadband infrastructure in Virginia and increase broadband access for unserved communities. Additionally, we invest $55 million in FY21 in the Virginia Housing Trust Fund um, with a particular focus on rental assistance to prevent evictions. And I will dis discuss that in greater detail on a later slide. Additionally, um, recruit, we're creating a one-time grant with non-general funds um, targeted to accelerating the development of drug therapies to treat COVID-19. Essentially, we're using the funds to get the drugs that are in early stage clinical trials to later stages of development. And uh, finally, we are redirecting funds in the commerce area to support short-term worker retraining, which Tony will discuss in greater detail in his slides. Um, we've worked uh, to update the language included in the introduced budget related to extending the moratorium on utility disconnections. The language extends the moratorium until 60 days 
after the end of the declared state of emergency or until health or economic conditions improve for residential customers. Um, additionally, the language establishes a repayment plan for all customers. It provides an off-ramp from the moratorium for utilities um, should um, their, their accounts receivable arrearages um, exceed one to two percent of their total operating revenues. It also includes extensive reporting language to provide us with better information on non-payments in advance of the regular session. And the language applies to all jurisdictional and non-jurisdictional utilities. Um, we couple this language here um, with a debt forgiveness requirement for phase two utilities and a significant investment of CRF dollars to help all utilities pay down arrearages for customers. Additionally, um, the, the package includes new language related to the evictions moratorium. The language in the package recognizes the current national moratorium on evictions providing that provide protections for tenants. Um, while the national moratorium is in place, um, our language sets out a rep repayment plan policy for tenants and landlords to work together um, in paying off those, those back payments. And it also um, requires, it also kind of guides people towards an application for rental assistance through the rent and mortgage relief program, which was set up in late June um, to help tenants um, get funds to help with their rent. Um, in the absence of, of the national moratorium on evictions, it establishes Virginia's policy um, towards evictions um, and that policy relies on applying for rental assistance through the rent and mortgage relief program and other sources prior to any evictions related action occurring. Um, and it also allows again for the creation of repayment plans um, to, between tenant and landlords to help both tenant and landlords um, you know, pay down um, those past due rents. Um, since Virginia's policy um, and our budget package relies on a successful rent and mortgage relief program. We allocate $25 million of the FY21 um, dollars from the Virginia Housing Trust Fund to the program to ensure that it lasts into the new year. It's currently funded with CRF dollars, which are set to expire at the end of this year. So again, we really want to make sure the program is successful and that it's able to, to live on beyond the end of this calendar year. And um, additionally, because the, the housing language included in the package um, relies on a successful rent and mortgage relief program, we also include some language that ensures that we can expand the functionality of that program, um, including allowing landlords to apply directly for the, the assistance um, from that program. Um, Additionally, our package includes a language amendment related to the Rebuild Virginia program, um, reacting to kind of the JLARC meeting uh, last week, I believe. Um, we are requiring the Department of Small Business and Supplier Diversity to re-examine the eligibility criteria and maximum grant award for the Rebuild program. Um, this goes kind of further than the steps that they've taken already to expand the program. Um, again, we want to ensure the dollars um, provided for the program to, can get to businesses that are in need uh, by the end of this year. Um, additionally, the, uh, the package includes a language amendment creating a one-year pilot program for FY22 to expand the potential applicant pool for the VADI program. Um, lastly, Ann, Ann mentioned this, or the chairman mentioned this in his opening remarks. We are including um, at a significant investment of CRF dollars for the unemployment insurance uh, program in Virginia. That's $210 million from CRF. Um, and that can go to support um, the UI program through providing supplemental benefits to recipients or increasing the solvency of our trust fund. Um, the budget package also includes a language amendment to direct a review of COVID-19 safety guidelines 
that will allow estheticians to provide um, facials in their service safely during, during phase three and beyond. Um, Ann already mentioned this, but we do include um, $10 million of CRF money to help general registrars address any additional cost for the November election. And, and it's set out to be very flexible dollars for them um, and allows them to use the funds to meet their own unique needs. And I, with that, I believe I'll pass it off to Zach Robbins. Thank you and good morning. Uh, the proposed budget package in the K-12 area addresses the concerns that we've heard from uh, localities and school divisions regarding the sales tax reforecasts and the, the mid-year reduction of, um, of $95.2 million in state aid. Um, also, uh, enrollment numbers are a concern uh, for school divisions as they're expected to fluctuate throughout the school year, uh, resulting in, in unpredictable state aid amounts in the current fiscal year. And um, we also address the concern uh, for the, the need for fle temporary flexibility regarding the use of state aid for K-12 to address the current emergency. And we also um, are aware of concerns from parents uh, to address childcare needs while schools aren't providing uh, uh, in-person instruction and, uh, and childcare uh, provider sustainability under the current social distancing requirements um, that have strained the capacity of the childcare system. Uh, the CARES Act provided Virginia with three funds that can be used to assist uh, with K-12 costs. Um, $238.6 million was provided through the, the ESSER fund. Uh, $214 million of that was distributed to school divisions as required by the Act. And there's a, the, the table, the distribution table uh, details the amount that was provided to each school division. Um, there was also a, a smaller state set aside um, that was in the, from the ESSER fund that was used for some competitive grants to school divisions. And the, um, the GEAR fund provided $66.8 million and the governor announced uh, $43 million uh, would be used to support K-12 with the remaining uh, $23 million going to higher ed. Uh, the coronavirus relief fund, um, the, the the, uh, the governor distributed $1.3 million of the coronavirus relief fund to localities, and um, that can be used to address uh, PK-12 needs. And we are aware that localities have dedicated a substantial portion of their distribution to K-12. And our budget includes, as Ann mentioned, uh, $200 million distribution uh, as per pupil payments. Uh, and the, the, the table uh, in your packets also uh, shows the allocation to each school division from that proposed allocation. Uh, the budget proposal allocates uh, CARES funds in two areas. Uh, the administration had planned to award $18 million to address uh, short-term remote learning needs such as laptops uh, and the provision of uh, internet access, uh, but the Department of Education received about $45 million in applications. This budget redirects um, $8.9 million in GEAR funding that was targeted for some longer term broadband expansion projects um, to, to um, provide a total of $26.9 million towards those shorter term needs. And as I'd mentioned before, the package takes advantage of that new federal guidance that allows uh, CRF funds to be distributed on a per pupil basis. And uh, the dollar amount each school division re would receive is about $159 per student. Uh, to provide relief to school divisions, um, a $95.2 million one-time hold harm harmless payment would be distributed to school divisions, uh, eliminating the impact of the mid-year uh, sales tax reforecast. Uh, and this would be funded, as we mentioned, through gray machine revenues, and it recognizes the financial impact of the pandemic, and it's not intended to set a precedent for um, to backfill future uh, sales tax reforecasts. Uh, to address uh, declining enrollment, and fluctuating enrollment counts throughout the year and the, the corresponding uh, impact on state aid. Uh, language in the proposal would direct the Department of Education to not adjust state payments to school divisions in January as it normally does. Uh, normally, ADM projections are adjusted uh, in, in December and um, in January, school divisions payments are adjusted to take into account um, the actual membership uh, members that come in in September. 
and those payment amounts are adjusted accordingly. And then they're adjusted again at the end of the school year. Uh, what this language would do is hold those payments steady until the end of the school year, and that would allow the General Assembly during the uh, regular session to examine the scope and the impact of ADM loss and fluctuation um, after fall membership counts are available and a few months of, of seeing how enrollment's impacted by the um, virtual learning and the return to in-person instruction. To provide uh, flexibility in the use of state K-12 funds, there are three actions included. Uh, first, uh, reinstatement of the waiver for school counselors and English learner teacher staffing ratios. Um, the flexibility for these positions had been in place since the uh, last recession, but it was eliminated at the 2020 session. Um, next, uh, there was a new requirement for school divisions to reserve 30% uh, of their lottery per pupil funds, which is now known as the infrastructure and operations per pupil fund. Uh, they were required um, starting in FY21 to um, reserve 30% for non-recurring costs and this budget would delay that taking effect until 2022. And then finally, uh, a provision would allow state textbook payments to be used in FY21 to meet COVID-19 related costs uh, and remove the local matching requirements from the textbook funds. And these, these actions in total would free up about $154 million uh, that is currently restricted um, to, re to address uh, pandemic related needs. Uh, the budget also restores funding for uh, several K-12 initiatives. Um, we we'll just note on the slide a $6.6 .6 million um, in contingent funding is provided uh, to restore the initiative to provide free school meals to reduced price eligible students. And that's provided the revenue targets are met. And then also, um, a $350,000 payment to support educational programming in the Southwest part of the state uh, through uh, Blue Ridge PBS is included. Uh, the, and moving on to child care, uh, the CARES Act provided uh, about $71 million to Virginia uh, that's been uh, used primarily for uh, stabilization payments for the child care industry and to provide, ensure that there are uh, child care slots available for essential personnel. Uh, this budget includes um, $60 million in coronavirus relief funds to provide stab additional stabilization grants for child care providers uh, to minimize the, the loss of providers in the system. Um, and also the, the introduced version of House Bill 5005 uh, it provided $16.6 .6 million in general funds to create contracts for uh, emergency child care programs for families that have been impacted by virtual schooling. Our proposal doubles that funding using uh, an additional $16.6 .6 in CRF funds and uh, language would direct that the CRF funds be spent down first so that those general funds could be used to support uh, emergency child care in the new year after the CRF funding expires on December 30th. And also there's language included to encourage partnerships uh, for space uh, to include alternative sites like religious institutions and community centers. And that summarizes K-12 and now I'll hand it off to Tony. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, members uh, in higher education, just to, as, as uh, context, again, recall that there was about $360 million uh, for higher education. Uh, you see it kind of outlined B below. All but about 15.4 million of that was eliminated in HB 5005 as uh, it introduced. Uh, the money that was restored uh, was the first year money for the HBCUs uh, in terms of the uh, new initiative, but there were no restorations proposed for fiscal 22. Um, so higher education right now is facing some significant challenges. If you go back to the spring with the closures, uh, there were tens of millions of dollars that were refunded back to students as well as revenues that were lost. Um, though the institutions also faced significant cost increases, you know, related to cleaning, disinfecting facilities, PPE, the telework, moving to online education, testing, et cetera. And the current estimates for those expenses for the fall of 2020 are well over $100 million. In addition to revenue losses uh, for both ENG and auxiliary, uh, from both losing uh, in-state enrollment and losing out-of-state students, even if they shift to in-state, uh, 
on ENG side, you know, with with the uh, with the uh, tuition loss, uh, the average, the midpoint for the system is about 160 million dollars, with uh, in-state undergraduates accounting for about half of that loss. Um, the midpoint on the auxiliary loss is is staggering. It's about 460 million dollars, primarily room and board, event revenues, things like that. Uh, understand that a lot of these current estimates are preliminary. Circumstances change daily, as you see from institutions as they report uh, new data as as we go forward. Um, on the next slide, so the first uh, recommendation uh, would be to uh, provide eighty million dollars uh, in flexible money uh, into ENG, so the institutions can utilize it for operational costs, for for financial aid, uh, for other cost, uh, other COVID related costs. The allocations of it would be based on uh, in-state undergraduates uh, addressing the estimated revenue shortfalls there. Uh, basically, institutions would get a minimum of about 5% of, the in -state un of their un in-state undergraduate revenues or about 40% of their average in-state revenue shortfall that, they're, uh, that they ha have estimated. Uh, the amounts for Mason and for Old Dominion do reflect the $10 million dollars um, of uh, of uh, of uh, monies that they would have received in in the first year, both amounts would exceed the the uh, the uh, two parameters. Radford's funding, for example, would also include two million dollars for the Carillion merger. And there's a floor; every institution would get at least one million dollars uh, from this particular fund. On to the next. Uh, in addition to the monies. Uh, the uh, notion of providing them more flexibility, uh, again, building on flexibility that you provided with regard to indirect cost recoveries, which occurs between ENG and the auxiliary. This would allow institutions to make use of fund balances from other fund sources, not just ENG, but other fund sources to support the auxiliary operations with the caveat that ENG balances could not directly support athletics programs. Uh, in addition to that, there is language uh, in the Affordable Access Amendment that would allow institutions prior to uh, if, if, if prior to the next session, if they if if they were to uh, reach the point of fiscal exigency. So before they had to institute massive layoffs or whatever, they could petition the governor through the op six group for some bridge financing. Uh, it would require op six review and approval, but at least it would give them a stopgap. Um, we mentioned CRF, about $119 million from CRF uh, would be allocated to the institutions. This is based on a recent survey that the OP6 group did related to COVID expenditures. Those expense data is for, for E&G and auxiliary. Uh, it represents the expenses only, not lost revenues, which are not eligible. And it would, it would, it would uh, uh, be directed to uh, help cover the cost of the cleaning PPE and online. In addition, 4.2 million uh, would go to state museums and libraries. And then I'm sure you're all aware the governor announced Tuesday uh, to restructure higher education debt, uh, which would save over the next three fiscal years about $300 million. Uh, I believe it's roughly around 50 to $60 million in fiscal 21, which could be saved about another 150 in fiscal 22, and then another 50 back in fiscal 23. The savings, though, uh, some of the savings would be uh, uh, dependent upon legislation in the regular session related to the 9C debt that would require General Assembly authorization. Moving on, other recommendations, there's $2 million uh, in the first year for a workforce credential program at the VCCS and Richard Bland that leverages private monies to train unemployed Virginians in high demand fields in partnership with uh, Ready Virginia. Uh, there's a million dollars to restore the online Virginia expansion in 21 and an additional million contingent in fiscal 22. And then there's a million dollars in fiscal 21 to local libraries to uh, expand broadband access for citizens and students. And I think Susan is up next. Uh, good morning, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. I'm going to take you through the health and human resources recommendations. Uh, the first one is a proposal to provide uh, $11.2 million um, in general funds in fiscal year 21. Uh, that would be matched with federal dollars to provide an additional quarter of nursing facility relief of $20 per day through March 31, 
2021. Um, and if need be, you can always come back and look at this issue again during the regular session. Um, there is an amendment uh, in your package to restore $882,000 each year um, to expand access to mental health services for children through the Virginia Mental Health Access Program. You'll remember that uh, the budget you passed uh, last uh, March included $4.2 million each year. That was unallotted and eliminated in House Bill 5005. Um, there's an also a recommendation for an additional $3.75 million each year for the state behavioral health hospital census reduction pilot programs. Again, last March, you had provided $7.5 million each year that was unallotted and eliminated in the current bill before you. Um, and then finally, there's uh, an amendment rec uh, that would restore $250,000 each year for grants for recovery residences that would serve individuals with substance use disorder. Again, that was also unallotted in April and eliminated in 5005. On uh, next slide, um, this is the contingent spending for uh, proposed for Health and Human Resources. Um, the first one is about $11 million in the current year and $22 million in the second year to restore the Medicaid rate increase for group homes, sponsored residential and group day support providers of DD waiver services using the updated data. Um, it would restore all of the second year in the last six months of 2021 that was unallotted in April and eliminated in House Bill 5005. Uh, the next contingent um, spending proposal would provide $6.2 million in the second year to restore the Medicaid rate increase for skilled and private duty nursing. Again, that's provided through the DD waiver programs. Again, that one also was unallotted in April and eliminated um, in House Bill 5005. Uh, the next one would um, provide uh, $586,000 in, in the first year and about $3.3 million in the second year to eliminate the Medicaid 40-quarter work requirement for legal permanent residences. Again, that was another one that was unallotted and eliminated. And then the last one on this slide would um, uh, provide $557,000 roughly in the first year and two point one in the second year to extend the famous mom's postpartum coverage to 12 months. And again, that was unallotted and eliminated in House Bill 5005. On the next slide, um, these are a number of language amendments that are recommended in the package. The first would require the health department uh, to develop a plan for the equitable distribution of a COVID-19 vaccine and other medications. Uh, the next one would require the health department to report actual deaths, not an extrapolated projection of deaths for COVID-19 and other infectious diseases. Um, and then the third one in the health department would require medical facilities that are licensed by the health department to allow designated persons to accompany and visit disabled patients. Um, in the Department of Health Professions, there's an amendment that would extend the waivers for nurse practitioners to practice without a written or electronic practice agreement until the termination of the uh, pandemic emergency declaration. Um, there's one amendment in uh, Medicaid that would extend the flexibility to allow relative caregivers of children to continue to provide and be paid for um, Medicaid personal care services through the pandemic and then through June 30th, 2021. Um, and if need be, you can come back in the regular session and look at this issue again. Um, and then the last one would restore language that was inadvertently eliminated in House Bill 5005 that removes the requirement that CSBs increase step Virginia services beyond those that were funded in uh, the 2019 Appropriations Act. As you know, the funding for to move forward on those services um, was unallotted in April and then eliminated in the current uh, House Bill 5005. Next slide just uh, puts forward the recommendations on the CRF allocations. The first would be $60 million for additional hospital payments for CRF related costs. That would um, require them to be used for remaining unauditable or remaining auditable COVID-19 costs after all other federal relief payments have been used. The next one would allocate $56.1 million for hazard pay for Medicaid personal care, uh, respite and companion care providers. So uh, that would provide $1,500 per personal care attendant in both the consumer directed uh, personal care program and the agency directed um, personal care program. Um, the, other, the last one on this slide would provide $25 million for retainer payments for Medicaid day support providers. 
um, from August of this year through December. I'll turn it over to David. All right, thank you, Susan. Uh, moving on to natural resources. Um, there are two uh, contingent uh, spending items, as Ann mentioned earlier. Uh, the first is five and a half million dollars each year in uh, land conservation uh, fund appropriations. Um, this was an increase that was provided last session that was then unallotted and then restored by the governor uh, with his introduced budget. Um, uh, second item is for uh, dam rehabilitation at the Department of Conservation and Recreation. Um, again, this had been um, unallotted and then restored by the governor. Uh, what uh, the amendment package uh, does here is reduces the first year amount from 15 million to 10 million and provides 5 million in the second year as a contingent appropriation. Uh, there are uh, a few language items. Um, first is uh, related to uh, compensatory mitigation policy language that was adopted in reconvene session. Uh, the amendment package here um, narrows the scope of that language to apply just to the Hampton Roads Bridge Tunnel Project. Um, and there is also uh, an amendment to re remove language that was included in the introduced budget uh, to establish a uh, statewide uh, solid waste disposal fee. Moving on to public safety, um, major uh, items here are related to the uh, 10 criminal justice reform bills that the House has passed. Uh, in total, um, the, the funding included in the package for, for these bills is just over $28 million for the biennium. Um, as Ann mentioned earlier, the funding for these bills uh, has been included in a single central appropriations uh, amendment and uh, will be moved to the appropriate agencies upon enrollment if the um, measures pass both chambers. Um, in another action, uh, there has been an amendment to restore funding for the uh, uh, local and regional jail board. Uh, this funding is related to a bill that was signed by the governor um, after the uh, 2020 regular session and uh, the, the funding should not have been un unallotted or taken as a re reduction to begin with. Um, on the next slide, uh, this is just listing out the funding related to the house bills that has been included in central accounts. Um, as I mentioned earlier, it's just over $28 million a year for uh, the biennium with the, uh, the largest amounts related to um, automatic expungement as well as earned sentence credits. Um, the net cost is just over 24 million as the governor had included um, some funding related to criminal justice reform in his introduced budget. And up next is Michael. Okay, um, moving on to transportation. The first slide, just uh, sort of a review of what was in the introduced budget. There were four language amendments within the secretariat, all designed to address issues related to the pandemic and the decrease in revenues. There was language in the secretary's office that allowed the CTB to redirect um, funding from certain programs to address revenue shortfalls, but with the requirement that it be repaid by 2025. Um, the next slide just shows the other language that was included in the introduced budget, including a giving DRPT the authority to allocate funds to maintain operating support for its operating budget at 2020 levels. Uh, the one amendment, significant policy amendment that is included in the pa package is an amendment that would require the secretary to report to the General Assembly prior to the effectuation of the transfers that were authorized in the introduced budget and it prohibit, prohibits the CTB from shifting allocations at the same meeting that where they propose the transfers, it, there has to be a one month delay to allow the General Assembly to have input on the proposed transfers. Um, moving on to compensation issues. Uh, the, net, the first slide just shows what the current balance is, is in the State Employee Health Insurance Fund. As you recall, last year we did a premium holiday because of the large balances in the fund. The, in spite of that, there has been a continued significant increase in the balance of the fund. It, as of at the end of July was 535 million. If there had not been a premium holiday, it would have been 657 million at the end of 
this July. So therefore, the package includes the authorization of another premium holiday in the current fiscal year. This would save $122 million all funds, saves $46 million GF. It also saves NGF and it saves the employees and the retirees money. And in addition, it saves the college's money, both GF and NGF, because of the um, the, the cost mixture of them, it would save them about $38 million. Um, the next slide just shows, in addition to that, there was funding in the, in the current budget for a premium increase of about 7 or 6.7% in 2022. Because of the high balances, we don't believe this is necessary. So there's an amendment that would cut this in half. There would still be $20.6 million for a 3.35% premium increase. And again, this could be this is in the second year, so this could be re-looked at again in the regular session when we have better, more data and see where the HIF balances are at that point. We've also included language that would require DHRM to contract with an actual firm to, to do a review of the actual process of the premium rate setting and look at and also come up with a recommendation of what they think the appropriate target level should be of cash reserves. The next slide just shows that there is a amendment that would provide a bonus for state employees and state supported local employees in the second year. It is contingent on not just there being there not being a decrease in revenues in the assumed in the introduced budget for the regular session and also that the actual revenues in the in 21 reach are, are not more than 1% below what is assumed in the budget. So the bonus would be $1,500 per state employee and uh, $750 for adjunct faculty due to the fact that they are part-time in nature and a 1.5% bonus for state supported local employees. And all of these would be authorized August of 2021 if the um, triggers are met. Uh, and uh, in capital outlay, Mr. Chairman, uh, recall again, House B and House Bill 5005, uh, there were no changes to the debt finance projects that were approved in Chapter 1289. Uh, there were two projects that, that were funded with cash that were eliminated. So there are two amendments that would restore the funding for those projects through the use of uh, Virginia Public Building Authority bonds. Uh, the debt capacity is still very strong uh, after factoring in uh, the entire debt package and uh, from from the previous session, as well as the revenue drop, the debt capacity is still $560 million a year for the next 10 years with an additional three years in excess capacity that is reserved. Um, in addition to restoring those two projects, there was language that the governor had proposed related to the DJJ project, which during conference, uh, the both bodies had agreed not to move forward with. The governor reproposed that language, so this amendment would strike that. And then there are three technical language amendments that are used that are needed to facilitate the Capitol Square projects uh, that are going forward now. Um, Mr. Chairman, we just have one final slide uh, wrapping things up here. In total, the amendment package contains about $404 million of increases, which are offset by the savings and revenue adjustments we discussed up at the front. Uh, this is $252 million approximately in new spending above House Bill 5005, uh, but contained within that is $207.4 million of contingent spending that won't be released unless the revenues meet forecast. Um, the hack amendments leave an unappropriated balance of $304.5 million at the end of biennium, trying to um, hold true to the governor's statement that cash is king in this time of uncertainty, we need to have flexibility in case things um, devolve further. The first year does include, as the chairman mentioned, a flexible revenue reserve deposit of $150 million in lieu of the rainy day fund deposit in FY22 that the governor had proposed based on his assumptions of where FY22 revenues will finally end up. Um, there's also language allowing that to be transferred for the rainy day fund at such time that you find there is a required um, deposit to that fund. And with that, um, I guess we could be available for questions. Okay. Okay. Are there any questions or comments for the staff? Mr. Chairman, uh, this is Kirk. 
Yeah, Delegate Cox. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Kim, this is for you. Could you go back to the language you talked about on broadband, broadband flexibility, creates a one-year pilot in FY 2022, expands the application pool. Can you give us a little detail on that, how that works and what it, what is involved with that? Yes. Um, so the language essentially, um, starting with FY22, and I want to make sure that's well understood. So it would not impact any of the applications that have already been received in the FY21 grant process for the VADI program, because we're appropriating $50 million for that program. So we want to make sure those dollars get out the door and do no harm to the program this fiscal year. Starting in FY22, um, it directs the Department of Housing and Community Development to look at a one-year pilot program that would essentially allow um, public broadband authorities and providers to apply um, for uh, VADI awards without um, a, a private sector partner. Um, an investment from a private sector partner, um, essentially expanding um, the applic potential application pool for, for broadband projects. The, the project, if it is from a public um, broadband authority under the pilot, has to be targeted to um, increasing telemedicine capacity and distance learning capacity within the community. Additionally, um, the pilot still holds true to um, the focus of the VADI awards going to unserved communities, which is, which is defined as anything um, without uh, access to fiber that's 25 over 3. At the end of the pilot, it requires um, DHED to put a, together a report, um, get, say, um, allowing us if projects are funded, um, to those pro public broadband authorities, um, how it went, um, what the application looked like, and allows us to get some better information to see if we want to pursue this idea moving forward. Just one more question on that, Mr. Chairman, because I haven't really Talks. studied that amendment. But as you know, as I recall, sort of with this whole thing, you know, you've got sort of what is considered unserved and underserved. And so obviously unserved would be Areas we've really targeted would this would would this change the definition? Because underserved is obviously something you can drive a truck through. So, uh, could you maybe address that a little bit? Yes, Mr. Chairman, um, this does not include underserved communities. It really just um, extends it to unserved. So it doesn't change that focus of the VADI program that directs those dollars to unserved communities. Okay. I'll have some questions later, but thank you for that. Okay. Mr. Delegate Chris. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I just want to follow up on uh, Delegate Cox's question there, Kim. Um, I'm on the Broadband Advisory Council, and I don't remember this coming before us. Um, and I, since it's a pilot and since it doesn't go into effect until 20, until next, the next cycle, is that something we can um, maybe the chairman could send a letter to the council to take this up to look into to look at this further because this as far as the the distance learning and the telemedicine part of it isn't that I mean that's that happens with any broadband expansion I don't I don't see really the how that's really uh, comes into play so I'm a little bit curious about this but I'd like to see uh, like to see us uh, have some more discussion at the council level thank you Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Delegate Blocks. Oh, th thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have a question about the the new bills with DOJ. Um, there's it looks like from year to year there's a really huge swing in expenses, um, and I guess I I'm looking more at the at the years going out, not so much the first year implementation. Is it going to level out the spending? Because I mean, all these look like new programs that we'll be carrying out for years to come. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, Delegate Blocks, um, um, you're really seeing uh, two things. Uh, the first is um, some of the, the bills are going to require large uh, one-time expenditures on systems improvements. 
Um, for example, the uh, automatic expungements bill from the, the majority leader, um, there's just about a $12.6 million um, pro IT project at state police that would have to be done uh, to update um, several of their core systems in order to be able to accommodate the bill. Um, so after that um, expenditure is made, those costs are going to go away. So uh, what you're seeing in year two on that table um, is, is going to be more uh, representative of what the uh, long-term ongoing cost of those bills would be insofar as we're, we're able to identify them at this point. Okay, any other questions or comments? Delegate Sickles. Mr. Chairman, I have a motion. Delegate Sickles. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I move that we report uh, HB 5005 to the full house. Second. It's okay. been moved. It has been moved and second that we report HB 5005 to the full house. Uh, Mr. Clerk, let's, uh, let's vote. Mr. Chairman. Uh, Delegate Cox. Can I speak to that motion? Delegate Cox, you have the floor. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Uh, first of all, I want to thank the chairman. Uh, and I've, he has been very responsive to us. Uh, and whenever I call the chairman, he always calls me back probably immediately. Uh, and I also want to thank staff because I've asked them a ton of questions and they're always great about that. But having said that, um, I just cannot vote for uh, this particular budget. And I really do feel like as a senior member, I need to explain that and I just vote. So let me first of all, because I think you should always talk about the positives first. This budget has some positives and staff has outlined that from the broadband money to the bonus. Um, OVN is something I really think is the future. So it's got some funding there. It's got some problem solving in it. I think with the coronavirus, coronavirus relief fund, uh, some of that allocation was necessary. And so you see that for reopening schools, which I've obviously tried to push hard for $160 per child, hospital reimbursements and some smart things in higher ed. Uh, I will say that I did push very hard for the read fund. I, I don't think we're doing enough for parents and especially flexibility there for teaching pods, et cetera. I'd like to have seen that. Uh, just looking at our general fund piece, I, I like the K-12 flexibility, uh, another $150 million there some really good work in textbooks and lottery non reoccurring. Uh, so I think that was smart. Even some of obviously our ratio pieces, uh, ADM is something we've heard a lot about average daily membership. And I do like that. We have uh, basically sort of done a temporary hold harmless. I think a lot of school systems have called for that. There were some bad budget amendments in my estimation that we didn't put in. I appreciate that everything from eliminating some state police funding, I think a lot of you know I'm very big on school resource officers, the select committee where we actually up the incentive grant from 1.7 million to about 4.7 million. And I'm glad that's in there. Uh, 599 funding, uh, which holds the $200 million base, uh, it of course reduces our 8.5 million that we put in, I think, back in the session, but we did at least do the core. Uh, here are my objections. Um, even though I really appreciate the staff and the chairman, uh, you know, we've got about 71 pages worth of amendments here. And uh, even though we were given, which I appreciate sort of PowerPoint briefings, we haven't read through the language. And so one of the things on the broadband amendment, I mean, you know, that the detail of that's very important. And so I think a lot of us take this job very seriously, but everyone on this committee likes to pour through the details. It's just tough when you, basically get the 71 pages of amendments and the detail of that. And you're trying to read them over essentially in about 45 minutes. So that I think is a problem. Uh, if you also look uh, just some of the bigger numbers, 251.8 million in new spending over the governor, 270 million more in contingent spending, uh, the unappropriated balance falls from about 490 to 305. And then, of course, an additional $10 million for, for voter safety. But and we sort of warned of this, of having to fund drop boxes, et cetera. But having said all that, this is the big one. 
Uh, I felt like this should be a session that dealt with uh, mainly budget items that has been dominated by obviously criminal justice reform bills. And we see that in the budget. This is the big item. If you look in public safety, about 28.4 million uh, in central accounts. Uh, and we can argue how much that's going to be in the future. I, I would tell you that's going to have a very negative uh, psychological effect on law enforcement, et cetera. I think you're going to have some costs associated with that uh, that are really going to be in the out years hurt us. I think that's ended up being too much of the focus of this budget. Today, we're going to deal with, and I don't know the outcome of this bill, but today we're going to deal with SB 5007 on sentencing reform. And that bill alone would have tremendous costs also. So it's we're in the beginning of the process. I understand that. But uh, I do appreciate the chairman's work and the staff's work. We just wanted to articulate why I can't vote for it. So I appreciate the time, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, Mr. Clark, we call the roll, please. Delegate Jones. Delegate Ferris. Delegate Jones. Delegate Ferris is a no. Delegate Ferris is a no. Delegate Jones. Clerk, please close the roll. Bill passes 14 to 7. Okay, Ann. Uh, Mr. Chairman, next you have Senate bills under consideration. They have been set out in two separate blocks. The Senate Finance and Appropriations Committee is meeting at 11. So we provided the opportunity for any of the patrons who are on that committee to present first, um, and then it will be followed by the remaining bills. Um, the clerk can call the bills in the sign up order within that category. I believe the first in the Senate finance block was Senator Edwards. Okay, thank you, uh, Madam. Uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Chair, um, Senate Bill 5014 is the Crisis Intervention Team Bill. We've had crisis intervention teams in Virginia uh, going back to the late 80s. It's been very successful at the local level. Uh, what this, by probably 70% of localities have the crisis intervention teams. Um, and what this bill does is to expand it so that every uh, law enforcement officer is required to uh, take uh, a minimal training at the basic training level uh, and then later a refresher program um, and that would be about 20 hours each time uh, when they're at the refresher recertification level they would have uh, minimal training as well this is in addition to the crisis intervention teams which are a 40-hour program and uh, I'm advised that there's no budget impact. Uh, the, uh, the various um, agencies involved have indicated that uh, there's minimal impact. The, for example, the uh, Virginia State Police uh, would be involved and they can do it within their budget. Uh, they don't believe there's a minimal, an impact. Uh, the Department of Criminal Justice Services, uh, the Department of Behavioral Health and Rehabilitation Services, um, uh, all these programs have indicated that they can do it within their own budget. So um, I've talked to uh, the Virginia State Police, um, I believe, supported, along with the Chiefs of Police, Howard Hall, who's the uh, Chief of Police of Ronald County, called me and said he supports it in his, he's in charge, I guess, of the uh, Virginia, uh, Chiefs of Police Association, and they support the bill as well. So I don't have any opposition. There is no budget amendment required. And so I would hope it's be the pleasure of the the uh, body to uh, report this bill. Mr. Chairman. 
Uh, Delegate Sipples. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I wanted to ask the staff, um, is, isn't there a substitute on this bill? Before us, is this a substitute from the Public Safety Committee? Hey, uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, Delegate Sickles, um, it was uh, amended in public safety, uh, but it is currently before appropriations as it was amended. So there, there are no further amendments or substitutes on this. Well, bill. Mr. Mr. Chairman, I would move to that we report as amended. Second. Second. It's been moved and seconded that we report SB 5014 as a bit. Uh, members, please cast your vote. Mr. Chairman, I believe that is since it came to you as a substitute, it is a public safety substitute, but you are just reporting the bill before you. There are no additional amendments. I think the appropriate motion is just to report. I, I withdraw a move to report the bill, Mr. Chairman. Is there a second? Second. Second. Uh, the move to second that we that we report SB five zero one four. Please cast your vote. Yeah. Delegate Plum. Delegate Jones. Delegate Plum. Delegate Jones. Uh, please close the roll. Bill reports 20 to 0. And Mr. Chairman, my apologies for not mentioning it sooner, but all of the members should have received the bill summaries separated by the two blocks. Carla sent out an email yesterday, and they're, of course, also out on iHot. Thank you. Mr. Chair, the next bill is SB 5024, Senator Lucas. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Senator Lucas, are you with us? I'm Mr. Chairman. Muted. Okay, I guess I muted myself. I'm here. Yes. Can you hear me? Can. Yes, yes, ma'am, we can. Okay. All right, I have uh, SB uh, 5024, and as you all know, it's the uh, bill that would pre prohibit law enforcement from searching an individual or vehicle solely based on the odor of marijuana. Um, it prohibits law enforcement from searching an individual or the vehicle based on, um, you know, as I've indicated, just on the smell of marijuana, and it reduces the non-essential interaction between law enforcement and otherwise law-abiding members of the public. And uh, that is pretty much the essence of the bill. I just wanted to be available to respond to any questions you may have, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman? Uh, yes. Um, I, I think... Um, I think Senate Bill 5024 deals with investigation and pattern of practices, correct? Yes. Not, not, I think the marijuana bill is up on the House floor today. Okay, well, I, the, the notice that I have is for 5024. Yes. But yeah, if you did, want, we, we have, I, 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 can, no, we, I can do pattern and practices. Are you ready for that one? Yeah, the, the bill that is before us, Senator, is uh, SB 5024. Okay, well, is, he said pattern and practices, or, or is it marijuana? No, it's it, it's dealing with law enforcement and, internal, and the Attorney General authorization to file civil suits that, or okay, inquiry. Uh, yes. Okay. That is, okay, that is one that is. Mr. Chairman, uh, Mr. Chairman, this bill is identical to our House Bill 5072. So I would just, uh, if the Senator is okay with that, I would just move the report and see if anyone wants to speak to the motion. Second. Second. Okay, it's been moved and second that we report SB 5024. Members, please catch your vote. Close 
Clerk may close the roll. Bill reports 12 to 9. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm sorry I had the wrong bill posted on my calendar for this morning, but yes, I thank you so much for passing pattern and practices. Have a good day. Thank you. Thank you, Senator. Senator, thank before you, Senator, yes, before sir. you leave, I think we I think we have another bill uh before us that's that's you the patron of SB five zero three zero. Mr. Chair, that's, 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 Lock, that's Senator Locke. Lock oh, I'm, I'm sorry. That's, that's Lock. Senator Locke's bill. My apologies. Yeah, my apologies. Locke and Lucas run together. <laughs> yes, the governor thinks so also. <laughs> Literally. Go ahead. <laughs> yeah. Go ahead, Mr. Clark. Mr. Chair, that bill is actually next. SB 5030, Senator Locke. Senator Locke, Thank you. I'm here. Yes, ma'am. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I believe that. Um, yes, I am. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, as reported from uh, courts, there were several aspects uh, of this bill that would conform to 10 of your House bills. Mm -hmm. uh, I emailed Deeds and told him that we were doing Senate bills now because he was in. Is that correct? Yeah, Senator Locke, please proceed. Yes. Okay. And and then there were some aspects of this bill that are not um, that were, that were no House companions, um, and that included um, uh, data collection for motor vehicle stops uh, to include uh, investigatory stops, uh, including pedestrian stops, and there was also an aspect of this bill uh, that includes. Uh, prohibition of shootings at, mo at moving boat motor vehicles. Um, and you had a bill, um, Mr. Chairman, regarding um, comprehensive report uh, by all law enforcement agencies, uh, including um, and, uh, this bill incorporate an aspect of your bill that passed in the, in the last session uh, to include uh, that use of force data, uh, but incorporating um, <clears throat> that 599 money um, would be held until that data was reported. Um, and until such time as that data is reported, uh, that use of uh, uh, that data would be, uh, until that data is reported, uh, 599 money uh, would be, uh, this uh, bill also includes um, that uh, prosecutors um, would be, uh, have the authority um, to um, drop charges. So uh, these are aspects of the bill that are not, that do not have House companion bills. So other than the House companion bills, this bill also includes that aspect. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, Delegate Sickles. At the appropriate time, I'd like to introduce a substitute for, for the, to the bill. Delegate Sickles. So could, uh, could staff read, read the substitute and explain what I'm, um, what we're trying to do here in the substitute. And Mr. Chairman, I believe council should be online to yes. their place. So thank you. Uh, yes, uh, Mr. Chairman, um, the substitute would remove the provisions in the bill related to the 599 funding. So it would re remove that section 9.1-168 in its entirety from the bill and then make a few accompanying technical amendments because of that in, in the enactment clauses. Mr. Chairman, if I could just speak to to the substitute, Delegate Sickles. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I don't want uh, uh, a Virginia public to uh, to believe that we want to uh, cut police funding. I think there's been allegations made that we want to do this, and even though this would not be done unless they didn't perform, as we said, I just think it's confusing to the public. And I think there's other ways to get the uh, law enforcement to comply. I believe they're professionals. I believe we're going to emphasize training and having uniform training across the state for everybody. And I think that we need to uh, make sure that everybody gets out there and, and gets our new laws under their belt before we even think about cutting our 599 money. So that's that's why I introduced this substitute. I don't agree with that, but Mr. Chair. Uh, Delegate McQueen. 
Thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. Chair, uh, could I ask the, uh, uh, the um, Delegate Sickles a question in reference to that? Um, you're saying that you're putting it on the police so there's a 599 money uh, withholding that. Does that speak to holding the localities accountable or does it the police department accountable? Well, I think that uh, uh, law enforcement, uh, both the sheriff's departments and the uh, police departments across Virginia are held accountable by local government and to yes. maybe a lesser extent us. And uh, so I, I think it's mostly a local government function. Obviously, this 599 money is a, is a small addition into the money, but I don't, I don't want uh, us to be taking this action at this point in time. And I think there's going to be a lot of activity across the Commonwealth as we implement all this new needed uh, criminal justice reform. Mr. Mr. Chair, uh, I, I think I am not in agreement with that because I believe that it must be a way to hold people accountable. And I think that if there's an understanding that some of the resources are not uh, going to be moving forward um, and to those like localities, then someone will take special, give special attention to addressing what is being required and what is being asked of them uh, in this particular bill. So I'm hoping that we will not support that, that amendment. And Mr. Chairman, if I may. A lot. Uh, it's just a matter of reporting data. And if um, agencies are reporting the data, they get the funding. Mr. Chairman, if I may. Uh, Delegate Hurst. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, speaking to the to the motion um, of adoption of the substitute, the other provision um, that is in there for the uh, distribution of funds for, for uh, 599 also includes that if we were to increase 599 funding, uh, that all police departments, uh, all departments that would be subject to those funds would need to be accredited in order to get those funds. In talking to my local police departments, accreditation is a, a very good thing, a thing that all departments are working toward, but it's also complex. Uh, and there might be mitigating factors that would preclude a, a police department uh, from being able to uh, to get accredited. I have a police department in Giles County that has one police officer, but it's still a police department. Uh, and trying to get that police department accredited would be a huge, huge task. So, um, you know, while I uh, agree in principle, I just wonder if that language, um, while well-intentioned, uh, might be something that we could just revisit later. Mr. Chairman. Uh, uh, in response to Senator Locke, who I uh, truly respect in the highest way, um, I think that our police departments can will will supply data when we tell them to do this without a potential sanction. So I hope that the committee will approve the uh, substitute. Okay, and Mr. Chairman, if I may speak uh, to the accreditation. Uh, Senator Locke. Um, that is is well delayed and it is something that um, law enforcement uh, asked for. And um, it is something that they uh, themselves want. Um, and it's, and it's, it's well delayed uh, if you would uh, look at the legislation. Uh, and, and, and to speak to what Delegate Hurst asked for, we can certainly um, make some exceptions um, moving forward. And we are working on this legislation uh, in terms of making some adjustments and amendments. Okay, uh, Mr. Clerk, uh, there's a substitute that is before us. Let's uh, call the roll for the vote, please. Mr. Chairman. Yes, uh, Delegate Collins. I didn't hear anyone second that. Not, I didn't hear anyone second that substitute. Second. Delegate Reed. Is this a roll call or are we using our iPads? We're using our iPads. This is a recorded vote. We're, uh, we're moving to report SB 5030, 
with the substitute. Mr. Ch Mr. Chairman. Uh, we have Doug Doug blocks him. Doug, Doug blocks him. Just, just for clarification, are we voting to accept the substitute? We're voting to accept. just the the change in the bill. Or are we voting to on the bill itself? No, actually, we're voting to whether we want to accept the substitute or not. Then we will vote on the bill. Okay. We're as to whether we want to accept delegate sickles substitute or not. Okay. Yes, sir. Thank you. We'll just have to fix that. Delegate Ferris. Mr. Chairman. Who's who's speaking, please? Delegate Hurst. Um, Delegate Mr. Hurst. I parliamentary inquiry. I just wonder, I, I just don't feel comfortable with this being up saying report with substitute on there. I wonder if we might be able to um, scratch the roll and, and get it in proper posture. I, I believe it would be a, a voice vote unless you wanted to do eyes and nays. Uh, we can we can uh, destroy the roll, please. Yes, Mr. Chair. Parliamentary inquiry, Mr. Chairman. Who's speaking, please? Lushery is aired. Uh, Delegate Air. Can you please restate the request of Delegate Hurst so I can understand what posture we are in? The posture that we are in, we are voting on whether or not we want to accept uh, a substitute that's being offered by Delegate Sickles. Thank you. And if I'm not mistaken, I think that we can do a voice vote to accept or not. But being that we are virtual, it's difficult to to um, to recognize the voice vote. That's why I call for a recorded Mr. vote. Mr. Chairman. Yes, sir. Uh, uh, do, uh, if the uh, question or if the committee's meeting again, I would request that the bill go by for the day. And. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, today is certainly the last scheduled meeting and it would be you cleared the docket of Senate bills before you once you get through today's list of bills. Okay, Mr. Chair, we can do a recorded vote for just a substitute. Let's do a recorded vote for the substitute, please. Delegate Hayes. Delegate Reed. Okay, Mr. Clerk, please close the roll. The substitute is adopted at 15 yeas, five and six nay. Senator Locke. That's disappointing, Mr. Ch Chair, <laughs> because data is not being reported now. So what uh, it will allow people to want, now want to report the data? But at any rate, it is what it is. Any other comments on SB 5030 before we vote? Mr. Chairman? Uh, Delegate Delegate Knight. Delegate Knight. Hope I'm not confused. I thought we were just voting to accept the substitute. Now we have to vote on the underlying bill. Is that correct? That is correct. Thank you. We're voting, and and 
someone help me if, if I'm speaking incorrectly, but we're voting on uh, House Bill 5030 to report with the substitute. Senate, Senate bill. I mean, Senate, I'm sorry, Senate, Senate bill. bill. That's Senate correct. Bill to report with the substitute. Mr. Clerk, please call the roll. <laughs> Clerk can close the roll. Bill reports 12 to 9. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator Locke. Mr. Chair, the next bill is SB 5043, Senator Deeds. Senator Deeds, are you with us? I'm right here, yes, sir. Um, this, this bill, uh, Mr. Chair, is now identical to um, Delegate Herring's expungement bill. It's exactly the same bill you've seen before. It, it, it's, it's, the, it's not the Senate version, which you, you've also seen, or this, the House killed this past session. Um, I introduced the same sort of bill this year, which was an expansion on, on existing um, expungement law. Delegate Herring's approach is a little different, substantially different, as a matter of fact, but you all have already approved it, and I ask you to, to report the bill. Delegate Sickles. Um, Mr. Chairman, I don't believe there's an amendment pending on this bill, so I would move uh, a new adoption. Second. It's Del been moved and seconded that we uh, adopt SB 5043. Members, please cast your vote that we report. Clerk can close the roll. Bill reports 13 to 7. Thank you so much. Mr. Clerk. Please, uh, there you go. My apologies. The next bill is SB 5007, Senator Morsi. Senator Morsi. Senator Morsi, are you with us? Mr. Chairman, I have an amendment if, uh, if the Senator's not here. Delegate Sickles. Well, yeah, Mr. Chairman, um, uh, the amendment before, before us would, uh, would uh, delay the enactment until July 1. That's all it does is just delay the enactment instead of, instead of being um, three months from the governor's signature as it would be if we did it now. It will just go in, go into effect on July 1 to 2021. There is some um, contention and dispute over how much this bill is going to cost. The FIS is indeterminate, and it's because people are trying to guess what the reaction, what human reactions will be to this bill. And so there's a study uh, underway on it, and uh, we'll have that in the general session in a couple months. And so hope to get a better handle on it, although. Uh, whether we're going to have more jury trials over the long term is is uh, disputed by the various parties. So anyway, I move adoption of the uh, amendment to extend implementation until July 1. Mr. Okay. Chairman. And I believe that's in the form of a substitute, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Delegate Bloxham. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Speaking, I guess, to the motion, um, I'm not really sure why we're going to do it. Why not just do a... Uh, um, a different way, like let's act on it in January and do a reenactment clause instead of a uh, delayed enactment. Delayed enactment is going to put it in play anyway, and it's not going to force us to look at it again. A reenactment, if we put a reenactment clause on it, it would force us to bring it back, and hopefully by then we'd have some real numbers. Would be my only point. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I see that uh, the Senator uh, Morrissey has joined us, uh, but we are one of only two states that do this in the whole country. And we have kind of a lottery with what is going to come out of our juries because they're not professionals and they're going to, uh, you know, 
the um, plea, we, we plea so many cases because defense counsel uh, doing their job wants to keep away from a jury that really doesn't have experience in sentencing. So, but I can't speak to it as well as Senator Morrissey can. Maybe he would like to speak to this motion to report the substitute. Thank you, Delegate Sickles. I appreciate the opportunity to speak before uh, the committee and the committee chairman and the members. With regard to what you just said, you're absolutely correct. Um, of the 50 states, only six states have jury trials and jury sentencing, but only two, Kentucky, the Commonwealth of Kentucky and the Commonwealth of Virginia have mandatory jury sentencing. So Virginia is truly an outlier. Everybody, whether you're a prosecutor or a public defender, a Republican or a Democrat have agreed that there is a, quote, jury penalty uh, in place if you opt to have a jury trial. And, and, that, and, the, simple, and that, the answer is what you were just alluding to, Delegate Sickles, and that's this. Jury, juries do not have the information that judges have. The judge has the sentencing guidelines. The judge has the nuances associated with parole or lack of parole. The, jury, the judge has a sentencing report, often a 15, 20 page report that allows for really a truly accurate sentence to be imposed. Um, right now, the juries try the case, they determine guilt or innocence, and then you use the word lottery, and it's actually a pretty good word because there's wild disparities. A Commonwealth attorney could offer two years, and this is not unusual, two years to plead, the defendant says, no, I'm innocent, I wanna to go to trial, and the jury comes back with 32 years. It happens every day in every one of the 133 jurisdictions. So where we move, what this does is allow a defendant to opt for a jury trial, but also avail himself of a judge sentencing. Mr. Chairman? It's Delegate Davis. Delegate Davis. I have a question for the patron, if that's okay, Mr. Chairman. Why don't we, uh, let, let's do this first. Let's, let's act, act on the motion for the, uh, the, uh, and Mr. Chairman, my apologies. It is a line amendment. I had it mixed up with a different bill. It is not a substitute. It's simply a line amendment. Yeah, let's 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 take take action on the line amendment. Then we'll come back to comments on the bill. I move the line amendment, Mr. Chairman. Back in. Mr. Mr. Chairman, uh, could I offer a substitute amendment? Uh, and could I speak to it? Doug, good night. Yes, sir. We've got down here the fiscal impact uh, statement, which says is indeterminate. We're charged with looking at the fiscal implications of the budget. We're not charged with looking at the policy of this. That is the courts. Uh, it's already gone through courts. They vetted that. We've got numbers down here that I've got numbers from Chesapeake, Virginia, that shows it's going to cost probably over a dollar per citizen for uh, every single juror, jury trial. So if we extrapolate those numbers, that's nine million, eight to nine million dollars only to pay the jurors. If you go to everything else in the fiscal impact uh, statement here, we could be 50 to 100 million dollars. We don't know. That could blow a big hole in the budget. So we're charged with the you know, fiduciary responsibility here. So with that said, with all these unknowns, my substitute would be, my substitute uh, amendment would be to offer a reenactment clause with everything that uh, Delegate Sickles said, the same effective date, everything, just strike the words uh, of his a delayed enactment clause to a reenactment clause. That is my motion, sir. Second. Second. Okay. Mr. Chairman. Doug Sickles. Uh, speaking to the motion, I think the policy is clear here. Uh, we've been, uh, we will have to uh, look at the financial implications of this in, in our future years, but I think those numbers are um, assuming that we're going to have all these new jury trials, and it's certainly we certainly will have 
more, at least in the beginning. But as this shakes out and people know what kind of sentences they're going to get from judges in their jurisdiction, the uh, defense lawyers are going to be able to know how to advise their clients on a plea deal. So this is just a transition to the way everybody else does it. And it may cost a little money up front. Uh, it may cost a little bit more full time. But, uh, you know, everyone in America is, is, uh, is uh, you know, uh, do a good jury trial. And they're not necessarily uh, shouldn't be dependent on their whims of the jury to their sentence, you know, to establish their sentence as well. But uh, just to establish their guilt or innocence. But um, I hope that we'll um, pass this and it'll give us time. We can we can come back to it if we find out or if we come to believe that the costs are too much. But we're talking about fundamental uh, justice here, fundamental uh, rights and freedom for our people. Let me uh, I, I, let, let me take a moment here. I typically try not to address legislation. Uh, Delegate Knight is absolutely correct. We're not we're not dealing with the policy. We're dealing with what it's going to cost the Commonwealth. And I voiced the, I voiced this concern with. Uh, uh, some folks in our caucus, and I'll share with you all today. Our responsibility as the House of Appropriations, we are we are we are charged with making sure that we appropriate the Commonwealth resources appropriately. It, the Committee on Courts sent this bill out for a study. That study has yet to come back with its conclusions which has given me some great concerns. Uh, we were moving this legislation forward, uh, hoping to put an enactment clause, a delayed enactment on it. But the, the challenge that we have and the responsibility that I have as your chair is to share with you all that we are here to appropriate the resources according to the knowledge that we have and the information that we have. That report has yet to come back. The amount of money that is going to be spent is undetermined at this time. And uh, I, I, will, I will support the recommendation by Delegate Knight. And I think that is appropriate. Uh, this is a very serious matter on all fronts. I get that. It has received a great deal of attention but we must do our job and we must do it right. And I respect Senator Morrissey and what he's seeking to do, but we have a responsibility as the House Appropriations Committee. And we need the information to determine how much this piece of legislation is gonna cost us. And with that said, uh, Mr. Clark, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Chairman, could I, could I make a comment uh, with respect to your comments? Yes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, let me say this, the, the two costs that are going to increase with the number of jury trials is gonna be the cost associated with prosecution of the case and the cost associated with defending the case, public defenders, court appointed attorneys. Now, VECA has done a magnificent job suggesting that it's going to implode the system, costs will explode, and we are gonna have an exorbitant number of jury trials. Interestingly, the other side, the public defenders, the Indigent Defense Commission, have said that their budget analysis is the following. They are not going to ask for one additional public defender, that the costs aren't going to go up. And indeed, everybody now knows that all this does is change the leverage where the Commonwealth has a huge advantage, a huge advantage. They already have mandatory minimum sentences, multiple felony counts, sentencing enhancements. Now they have the jury penalty. And Mr. Chairman, all this will do will force prosecutors to give plea agreements commensurate with the charge or the offense. And that's, that's it. Um, in, in, Prince, in Arlington County with 250,000 citizens, uh, they, their public defenders have opined that after two or three months, it's gonna go back to right where it is right now. 
And I think the following is the most telling statistic. There is a matrix done of all the states in the country that have jury trial judge sentencing, which is what I'm requesting. The two okay. lowest states are Nebraska and Kentucky for jury trials. That is, they have jury trial judge sentencing, and those two states, Nebraska, excuse me, I said Connecticut and Nebraska, have the lowest request for jury trials. So congratulations to Vacant for making, uh, suggesting that we will have millions and millions expended. It's not going to happen, Mr. Chair. And additionally, the global savings to the Commonwealth is going to be in the tens, if not hundreds of millions, because we're not going to have uh, the cost associated with mass excessive incarceration. Uh, thank, thank you, Senator. Let me share, let me share this with you. I, I am not in yes, opposition sir. to legislation, not at all. We just need to make sure that we do the right thing from a stewardship standpoint for the Commonwealth. And uh, once that report comes to us, we will have an opportunity to take a look at it and then uh, move forward with uh, SB uh, 5007. So I really I thank you. And I want, the, I want the public to understand that we're not against the legislation. We simply want to make sure that we're doing the right things financially in regard to the stewardship of the Commonwealth of Virginia. Uh, Mr. Clerk, please call the roll. Mr. Chairman, what, what is the motion before us? Do we have a substitute motion? We have a substitute motion from Delegate Knight. And Delegate Knight, please restate. Yes, sir. My substitute motion is to offer a reenactment clause where Delegate Sickles had in his a delayed, enact, a delayed enactment clause. Mine is going to be a reenactment clause to, to be effective until July 1 of 2021. And Mr. Chair, Mr. Chair. We, are, we are voting on uh, Mr. Clark. Yes, Mr. Yes, sir. Mr. Chair. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm recognizing the clerk at this time. Mr. Chair, just to clarify, we are voting on the adoption of Delegate Knight's amendment, correct? Yes, sir. Okay. And before we vote, uh, I think I heard Delegate Ferris. Yes, sir. I have a substitute motion to gently lay this on the table till we come back next time. What? Nothing will change. Nothing will be any different. No, Delegate, Delegate Ferris, Delegate Ferris, we're going to vote on, we're going to vote on Delegate Knight's motion. Are you ready for me to open the roll, Mr. Chair? Yes, Mr. Clerk. Chair, this is Delegate Jones. I'm here and I vote no. Delegate Jones is a no. Mr. Chair, the votes are 12 yay, 9 nay, and 1 abstention. Thank you. Close the roll. Now we will vote on passage of SB 5007. Mr. Chairman? Do, do, we, do we have a second for a question for the patron? Um, excuse me? It, it's Delegate Davis, Mr. Chairman. Do we still have a time for a question for the patron? Uh, Mr. Chairman, no, we're gonna make no. Excuse me, y'all excuse me for a second. We have several more bills before us. We're gonna vote on SB 5007. Uh, Mr. Clerk, please call the roll. There, has there been a motion? Point of order. Uh, I believe um, Delegate, Sickles is, Delegate Sickles is their motion. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I move that we uh, pass SB 5007. Second. It's been moved and second that we pass SB 5007. Mr. Clerk, please call the roll.
Delegate Tyler. Delegate John to the yes. Delegate Tyler is yes. Delegate Tyler is yes. Uh, clerk, please close the roll. The measure reports 13 and 9. Mr. Chair, the next bill is SB 5017, Senator Boyce. Thank you, Mr. Chair. It comes back to us now to the Senate with a. Isn't it going to go to the. Arena? Um, good afternoon, or actually, good morning, uh, committee. It's good to see you all. Um, I'm presenting SB 5017. It will um, add locally owned facilities to co that contract with federal government for immigration detention centers to the definition of local correctional facilities for the narrow purpose of public health. It will allow the Commonwealth to inspect local corrections facilities being used to detain immigrants, including the Farmville and Caroline detention centers, both of which have experienced uh, COVID outbreaks. Um, it was voted uh, successfully through the Committee on Public Safety on a vote of 13 to 8 with one abstention and I um, I ask that you pass it on to the House floor. Mr. Chairman. Who's speaking please? Delegate Krizak, I'm sorry. Okay, Delegate Krizak. The, I'd like to speak speaking to the bill and speaking to the bill. Um, so regarding the as as the chairman has mentioned, uh, this is about fiscal situation. This is appropriations, and speaking to that, um, all this bill does really is is add two facilities uh, to an inspection regime that all already carries out dozens of inspections um, a year. And it's a, which is really a, a de minimis cost. And it's a small price to pay to save the lives of folks in those communities that are from the, could be from infected staff members. And also, the, has passed away uh, at the Farmville site. Um, and so I, I think I would, um, at, the, at the appropriate time, I'd like to um, move to report, make a motion. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Delegate Mr. Chairman, this is Delegate Ferris. I have a question. Delegate Ferris. If this is a federal, if these are federal facilities, what uh, what jurisdiction do we have to do these? Uh, I know Krizik, uh, Krizik just said that, that we were doing some uh, inspections. But I, I, I'm just questioning what the state what authority we have over the federal facilities. Mr. Mr. Chairman, would you like uh, me Senator to? Senator Bosco. Yes, sir. Um, so to explain, uh, Mr. Chairman and Delegate Ferris, the Farmville and Caroline detention centers are owned and run by the town of Farmville and Caroline County, and they're not comparable to military bases or prisons or other federal facilities. The localities are contracting with ICE to house the adult detainees in, in the civil immigration proceedings at a per day rate. And because these contracts, the Commonwealth has treated these facilities as outside their jurisdiction with respect to health and sanitation. The facilities that contract with the federal government to detain the immigrants have, um, have had serious COVID outbreaks. And, um, and at present, the Virginia Code does not clearly give the Commonwealth authority to con conduct these health and sanitation inspections at the local Virginia facilities that solely hold federal immigrants um, detainees. It, it's, it's, we're kind of in the middle. So the federal government is not really um, treating them as federal facilities. The state at this point is not treating them as local facilities. And so they're kind of in, in the middle stuck without anybody really taking um, jurisdiction. This would bring them into the, the local facilities 
just for the purpose of health and sanitation and would give the Commonwealth the ability to protect not only the, the detainees, but also the employees and the people in the community who are working in those facilities. It's a small change, but it could be very meaningful. And we know that in Caroline County now, over 200 people have just been um, um, uh, diagnosed with COVID over the past, I think, week and a half. Um, almost the entire facility at the Farmville um, Detention Center were have already gone through one break through you know breakout and somebody has died. So this is a small change that could really improve the lives of the people who are working in those facilities. Okay, Delegate Kreese, I got think you have a motion. Yes, Mr. Chairman, uh, I would like to move to report the bill. Thank Second. you. Thank you. Okay. It's been moved and seconded that we report SB 5017. Uh, Mr. Clerk, call the roll, please. Uh, please close the roll. Bill reports 12 to 8, one abstention. Mr. Chair, the next bill is SB 5018, Senator Bell. Senator Bell, are you with us? I am here. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Uh, this bill is. Uh, the uh, conditional release for terminally ill prisoners. Uh, I will point out to the committee, uh, the current law allows people who have a terminal diagnosis to apply for a release. It doesn't guarantee release, just means they can apply. Uh, and it currently is at three months. Uh, this bill would change it to 12 months, which is in line with the JLARC study on this subject. Uh, there's also been um, a great deal of, of discussion on this. Uh, we wanted to make sure it was not only in alignment with the JLARC study, but also 2018 uh, Federal First Step Act, which was passed. Uh, we have done a couple of other changes. It excludes class one felons from applying for this and also anybody who's committed murder. Uh, so we've already taken those out. Uh, the, um, the reality is of these prisoners, 80% uh, of them are bedridden 100% of the time. Uh, the pro board already has regulations which would preclude them from considering anyone who's a threat. Uh, they also have to have a care plan in place for them. Uh, oftentimes where they would go is into uh, hospice care with family members or to a hospice facility. Uh, it's an end of life issue and with COVID being present, if one of these uh, folks unfortunately with a compromised uh, health uh, situation were to get COVID, it would be an immediate, de immediate death sentence. I should also point out it does provide a significant cost savings. Uh, the care for a terminally ill prisoner is approximately $84,000 in their last 12 months of life. Uh, it's difficult to provide specialized treatment, uh, often involves multiple correctional officers escorting the prisoner to the hospital facility, et cetera. Uh, so it's been, uh, it's been something that, that we thought would be a compassionate thing, and I think it, it would be in the best interest of the Commonwealth, uh, both uh, from a morality and also from a financial standpoint. With that, Mr. Chairman, I'm happy to answer any questions that you have. I believe that there is a, a substitute with this uh, piece of legislation. Mr. Chairman, can uh, can council uh, read the substitute, explain the substitute, Lisa? Yes, sir. Uh, sorry, trying to unmute. Um, so the substitute would include the various provisions that were included in um, previous bills that you've enacted on um, relating to the good time credit excluding certain crimes. This would include that same list of crimes to say that if, if the person um, was serving a sentence for one of the enumerated crimes, they would not be eligible for, uh, to, to petition for the, the terminal release. So Mr. Chairman, um, those those additional crimes include in what can include what? Um, it's a laundry list of crimes, but they're basically violent um, crimes that are considered violent crimes against the person. Um, I don't have the exact list in front of me. Yeah, Mr. Chairman, um, I believe that's listed in the um, bill summary that staff yeah. provided to the members. It's on it's on page five for the members. 
Mr. Chairman, could I speak to that briefly? Uh, uh, Senator Bell. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, my, uh, I thank uh, 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 Delegate Sickles. Uh, he, he spoke with me in, uh, before about this. I appreciate uh, where he's coming from. He's my good friend. I'll just say that uh, this was debated heavily in the courts committee. Uh, this, this amendment failed there. It failed uh, by a, a very large vote. Uh, and frankly, I would also have to go back. This is a policy decision. Uh, the policy committee decided to move this bill forward. And, and there's a significant difference between the parole release bill and this bill. That's someone who's not terminally ill. This is someone who's on their last days of life. So I would argue that there's a significant difference between these two. And the policy committee has met and made a decision on this. Uh, and frankly, it saves more money to let more of these folks out of jail. So with that, Mr. Chairman, I will uh, obviously accept the committee's uh, decision and move forward. Okay, there's a, there's a substitute that's before us and we're gonna ask the clerk to please call the roll and let us vote on the substitute. Mr. Chair. Uh, yes, sir. I don't believe that I heard in a uh, second on that substitute. Second. Thank you. Second. Second. Members, please cast your vote. Chair, Delegate Jones is a yes. Delegate Jones is a yes. Yeah. Mr. Chair, we have 17 yeas, five nays, zero abstentions. Okay. Uh, now, uh, Mr. Clerk, if you can uh, call the roll, we're going to vote on SB 5018 with the substitute. Mr. Chair, can I ask a question about the substitute? Mr. Chair, can I ask a question about the substitute? Uh, uh, Senator Bell. Um, maybe this is for counsel. I don't know if Delegate Sickles can answer this, but on the move to three months from, um, I mean, uh, the current law allows it three months. Did you word the substitute in a way that it would change the, um, it would add the other crimes that are uh, excluded to the three months or would the current law be different for three months versus 12 months? Uh, Mr. Chairman, I did not change any of the language in the substitute that came over from judiciary, except to say that if a person was serving a sentence for those particular crimes and they were the geriatric or terminal patient, uh, then they would not be eligible. I did not change anything related to the three versus the 12. Mr. Chair, I, I'm not bringing this up to, to quibble about, about the change I accept the substitute. Uh, I'm just trying to make sure we don't have confusion that the parole board will look at with two different instances, one for people at three months for petitioning versus one at 12 months. If there's no confusion there, uh, I just want to make sure we can clean that up now for new board. If you understand where I'm coming from. Okay, any other comments from staff in regards to Senator Bell? To clarify again, the existing code would allow people in this excluded category to apply for release for consideration. We're at we're changing the twelve to uh, the three months to twelve months, and then on the twelve months we have a group that's excluded. So my my real issue: do we have a conflict there or not? Lisa, do you want to comment on that? Yes, sir. Sorry, I'm at the Senate, so I keep trying to mute so that y'all aren't hearing them. Um, so I. The, defin the 12 months is, is within the definition of the people, um, the terminal individuals. And so I don't believe there's any confusion. I think that 12 months carries with this, this particular group of people, if that makes I sense. Think, I thank the chair. <laughs> thank you. Um, Mr. Chairman, I would move the bill, move uh, Senate Bill 5018. Second. Right. Mr. Clerk, please call the roll. Chair Delegate Jones, the yes. 
Elliot Jones is a yes. Please close the roll the, the bill reports 14-8. Chair, the next bill is SB 5034, Senator Boyce. Thank you, Mr. Chair and uh, members of the committee. Um, 5034 increases the amount of sentence credit eligible to be earned by inmates. My bill was conformed exactly to Delegate Scott's bill, HB 5148, in the House Courts of Justice. It has favorably been considered by the Crime Commission and was voted out of the Courts of Justice Committee with a 12 to 8 vote. Um, I ask that you re report it to the floor. I move to report. Second. 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 It's been moved and seconded that we report SB 5034. Yes. Substitute. Mr. Chair, Jones is a yes. Clerk, close the roll. The bill reports 12 to 8. Thank you so much. Y'all have a great day. Mr. Chair, the next bill and the last bill is SB 5038, Senator McPike. Good morning, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Senator McPike. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, this uh, Senate bill is uh, being referred to as the Marcus Alert Bill. Uh, this is the substitute that was adopted by the, the Public Safety Center as uh, Delegate Bourne's House Bill 5043, uh, uh, establishing uh, the framework for uh, mental health uh, mobile uh, first response, uh, co-response framework uh, within Virginia, as well as Delegate Bourne's uh, framework does create pilots uh, across Virginia uh, phased in over time and happy to answer any questions from the committee, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman. Uh, Delegate Sickles. Since this bill is now exactly like the bill we've already passed out in uh, the public safety substitute conforming it to HB 5043, I would move to report. Second. Then moving and second that we report SB 5048 as coming to us as a substitute from the Public Safety Committee. Uh, Mr. Clerk, please call the roll. Mr. Chair, Jones is a yes. Delegate Jones is a yes. Uh, please close the roll. The bill reports 13 yeas eight nays and one abstention. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you uh, to the committee. Uh, that concludes our docket for today. Thank you all so very much for your involvement, your participation. And uh, let me, I just, I just wanna close with a comment. Um, and I know all of us take our work very seriously. And uh, I, I just want us to understand why we're here. We're here to make sure that we appropriate the Commonwealth resources appropriately. And as we deal with various policies that come before us that has a physical impact, our job as appropriation members is to appropriate the resources of the Commonwealth in light of the challenges that we have before us. I thank you all and we will be in touch with each of you, letting you know when we will be meeting again so thank you and have a great day and any comments uh yes mr chairman i just wanted to um provide an update on a couple of dates the committee staff will be providing um a another version of the powerpoint on monday for the public and non-committee members to hear at 10 a.m that will of course be live streamed the clerk's office should be sending out notification that the deadline for floor amendment to the budget will be Monday at noon and any requests for items to which there are objections will be due in to the clerk's office by um, Tuesday at 10 a.m. I believe the intent at this point is to hear the budget on the floor Tuesday in your noon session. Okay. All righty. Thank you. We stand adjourned.